Hello, everybody, and welcome back uh, to this final session of the day. So um, in the first three quarters of our day, we have been steadily working our way through the centre's uh, thematic areas of activity. And we've had some really exciting presentations on what you can do with population wide linked national structured healthcare data. We've heard about cardiovascular imaging at scale and we've heard about data enabled clinical trials. So now we're going to up the pace a bit and uh, in under half an hour, we're gonna cover three remaining thematic areas of activity on wearables, phenotyping and cohorts. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna crack on and introduce our first speaker who is Professor Spiros Dinaxis. He's Professor of Health Informatics at UCL in London. He's the Centre's Associate Director for Computable Phenotypes, and he's going to speak about defining and redefining disease phenotypes at scale using electronic health records. Spiros. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to talk and apologies for my voice. I'm, 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 a, bit, uh, I'm a bit ill. So I'm going to be talking about computational phenotyping, which is the research uh, a theme that I lead in the BHF Data Science Centre. Um, so our, our vision, to put it simply, is to increase both the phenotyping depth, uh, the phenotyping breadth, and the phenotyping scale, now that we have this unique opportunity, uh, as many others have mentioned during the day, in terms of the amount of patients that we can look at, the amount of diseases that we can examine, uh, and the amount of sort of analytical pipelines that, that we can build. Um, so just to cover the base, what is phenotyping? And it's a term that's often used and it's been used quite a lot today. Uh, and in contrast with uh, research data that are like the UK Biobank, for example, that are often uh, very beautifully curated, uh, EHR data are very messy. They represent the real world. Uh, and the more sources you use, uh, the more amount of work you need to put into, such as the work that Tom and John mentioned, in order to transform it into something that can be used for research. Uh, and a lot of the time that we spend using uh, the rich data in the data science center and the TRE is essentially building phenotyping pipelines. So identifying, given the raw data of a patient across multiple sources, who has a particular disease, uh, when did they get it, uh, can we ascertain the severity, and can we say uh, with some sort of uh, certainty when, uh, when did they get it. Um, so, uh, what is a phenotyping algorithm? And again, these are algorithms that are used to transform the data from multiple sources into uh, the, the data elements that I mentioned. And it's really important to, to say that it's not just codes and code lists and the terms from ICD or SNOMED that are used, but it's actually the logic, in which case this is an algorithm that identifies atrial fibrillation. So, it's the logic in which these codes are combined that often includes a temporal aspect. And one of the key outputs of the computational phenotyping thing is to find a way in order to represent these in a way that can be uh, that these algorithms can be shared, curated, and reused by the research community, along with uh, sort of any relevant validation evidence that might be uh, used. Uh, how do we increase phenotypic depth? Uh, and as many mentioned, we have a very very rich set of data sources available uh, for us in the TRE. And one of the primary aims of the theme will be to use the data in the NICOR cardiac registries uh, that deal with different aspects of cardiovascular disease on a national scale, the stroke registry, uh, and as Richard will mention, uh, pharmacy and inpatient dispensing data uh, in terms of uh, actually building more accurate phenotypes, but also uh, evaluating the current phenotypes that we have using this sort of bespoke data collection systems that are available in, in the UK. And, and this has many multiple use cases uh, across different modalities, as, as other associate directors will, will mention. You know, there's implications for the wearables theme using text data, imaging data, and trials. So this is very much a cross-cutting endeavor that uh, this theme will, will, will enable. How do we increase the number of diseases that, that, we, can, uh, that, that, that we can study at any given time? So the current uh, challenges that researchers face is that the information is very fragmented. So you know, only an ICD-10, which is the terminology that is used in hospitals in the UK, tuberculosis, for example, is stored in five different chapters. Uh, and uh, ICD-10 codes have you know, various levels of, of resolution. They're quite heterogeneous. 
they mix different things together like disease syndromes uh, and they're organized by disease organ rather than clinical specialty. And, and all of these challenges are, are exacerbated when you start trying to look at multiple diseases at a time. And even more importantly, when you start looking at multiple sources of data at a time. And, you know, Angela showed this really beautiful Venn that uh, you can see that, you know, every source, no source is complete and every source contributes its own set of data. Uh, so we're taking some initials towards creating computational phenotypes across the phenome. What does that mean? That means creating a machine-readable systematic catalog uh, of EHR phenotyping algorithms covering the entire human phenome. So starting with cardiovascular disease as part of the data science center and then expanding outwards. So this is hierarchically organized. Uh, it, you know, we'll calculate a number of uh, standardized statistics around the phenome in order to be able to uh, better characterize it. And again, this is only something that we can do now that we have access to fantastic national level, true population level data, and then uh, offer a, a number of sort of rich annotation layers above it, such as, you know, linking to clinical guidelines, organizing by clinical specialties, linking to specialized ontology, such as orphanage for rare diseases and other things. So all of this will essentially be a big knowledge graph that will be for the first time created and curated using national data uh, on, you know, from the entire country across healthcare settings of so primary care and secondary care. Once we have this uh, sort of scaffolding, we could start examining diseases at, at, at sort of a national, uh, a sort of a, like a, a whole system level. And this is uh, sort of a, a caterpillar plot uh, that shows uh, all three digit ICD-10 codes. This is using all hospital data over the past sort of 15 years or so. So the entire copy of HES looking at both common and rare diseases. Uh, and this is sort of log, log scale. So this is in 56 million patients. So this is sort of the human phenome at a sort of bird's eye view. And then we can start drilling down and we can start uh, sort of using the scaffold to generate uh, sort of descriptive statistics and in-depth views across different specialties. On the left as the prevalence, the sex ratio between females and males across all of the sort of 5,000 uh, clinical phenotypes that we've defined. And on the right is sort of the hazard ratio for COVID uh, sort of death, as we've called it, COVID toxicity. And again, you realize that, you know, using this, you can see really highly heterogeneous uh, presentations, manifestations and associations, which are only possible to group and manipulate once you have this sort of scaffolded. Um, and finally, you know, very interested in phenome-wide association studies that are, uh, that have been traditionally used in genetic studies very much, but now we're going to be applying them. Uh, into non-genetic studies. And again, this is a, 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 G, a, F, a FIWA study in the TRE uh, looking at uh, COVID death. Uh, and this is sort of, we did it towards the start of the pandemic uh, and this reiterates how it's very useful to generate hypotheses. So this just uh, replicates all of these conditions that were already included in the clinical vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, and finally, you know, the part, the computational part is about reproducible science and we're going to, you know, we're heavily using open metadata standards uh, and, and different technologies in order to curate everything that we build and in order to enable reproducible science. So as Angela and others have mentioned, all of what we do is both in GitHub and the HDR phenotype library, and we spend a lot of time making uh, things uh, available to, to others. Uh, and that's all my slides. Thank you very much. Thanks, Biros. Fantastic. Uh, note, audience, that we appoint our associate directors based on their ability to get up from their sick bed and give attend a meeting and give a talk, uh, despite uh, not being so well. So, thanks, Biros, in particular, for joining us uh, today. So, um, next up, we have uh, Professor Tim Chico, who's uh, professor of cardiology uh, at the University of Sheffield, and he's the centre's associate director for personal monitoring data. And he's going to talk to us uh, about how we can maximize the benefits and minimize the risks of working with personal monitoring data. Tim. Thanks, Cathy. Apologies, I'm quite well today, but um, I'll, I'll, still, I'll still try and deliver. So my aim today is to pose this question and to ask you to work with us uh, to answer it and help form and implement the plans to take it forwards. Personal monitoring data includes data from smartphones, wearables, and an ever-increasing range of both consumer and medical devices. You know, why do we need this? After all, as you've already heard, we already have a huge amount of data to deal with. Well, 
we need this because despite all the data that already exists in NHS systems, I promise you that doctors like me do not and cannot understand fully someone's cardiovascular health without this kind of data. I'll give you some examples of, of pretty obvious types of data. Symptoms are the things that people come to us complaining about in the first place, breathlessness, chest pain, dizziness. But actually, we still don't measure them. Physical activity is intimately linked to heart disease, and yet we don't measure this. We know that a person's environment is a key determinant of disease, and yet we don't measure this. And although we know that heart rate and other physiological measurements are critical to understanding cardiovascular disease, we don't systematically measure this in daily life, during symptoms, and over time. So these types of data are not just hypothetically relevant, they are unarguably and obviously important, and they're already measurable using current technologies. But, it's important to recognise that personal monitoring data on their own are not actually that useful. It's only when this data is linked to other forms of the kinds of health data we've been hearing about already, the medical record, lab tests, imaging, etc., that it will fulfil its potential um, to provide a comprehensive picture of an individual's cardiovascular health. Now, this linkage present substantial technical challenges, but it is, of course, what Health Data Research UK and the BHF Data Science Centre uh, are very good at. Now, linking personal monitoring data to existing health data at large scale is highly likely to lead to three major advances. The first is to allow us to discover uh, new causes of uh, heart disease by understanding in detail what factors are associated with risk of current and future disease. It will allow us to measure the things that matter most to patients, whether that be symptoms, activity, quality of life, and test which treatments improve these outcomes, both in clinical studies, but also routine healthcare. And lastly, it will enable us to understand whether providing your personal monitoring data to your doctor allows her to make a more accurate diagnosis, provide a more effective treatment, or better predict future disease. This all sounds great, doesn't it? The problem is, it is entirely possible that we could mess this up if we don't recognise and mitigate the risks inherent in this approach. Well publicised examples have already been referenced earlier on, care.data, GPDPR, where building projects before building trust have caused them to fail before they even began. And although patients and the public express high levels of support for use of personal monitoring data, they're also fully aware of risks that are real, serious and must be taken into account. Personal monitoring data is inherently sensitive data. And as Kelvin explained earlier on, linking this with a person's medical information makes it many times more sensitive, as well as increasing its value for exploitation for purposes that are not to the benefit of the person or even society. So protection of priv privacy and pr security has to be at the heart of our theme. Now, sadly, health inequalities are already uh, highly uh, prevalent, and although personal monitoring data has the potential to improve these, done wrong, it could make it worse. We can't allow the quality of someone's health care to depend on what uh, level of phone or data package they can afford. And lastly, we need to make sure that personal monitoring data, providing that data, more and better data, strengthens shared decision making and empowers patients and not erode the relationships between doctor, patient and healthcare system. So all these considerations drive the three aims of the personal monitoring theme of the BHF Data Science Centre. Our first aim is to work with all stakeholders, including you, to establish best practice in public and patient engagement, transparency, information governance, device regulation compliance and interoperability. We have to do this first and we have to do it immediately. Our second aim is to establish the infrastructure that obtains the personal monitoring data that patients and clinicians and researchers tell us are required and acceptable to collect and link this to existing NHS data. Now, personal monitoring data exists on a, a spectrum of complexity, as does the health data that we want to link to. To try and start uh, with early wins, we want to begin at the less complex end of both types of data, 
gaining experience and critically earning trust that allows us to build bigger and better and larger infrastructures that allow us uh, to perform bigger and more ambitious research. And then lastly, we want to lead and support uh, exemplar projects that use this infrastructure. And we want to keep the period where we're taking on trust to the barest minimum. We need to deliver new research insights and in better healthcare as soon as possible to justify these approaches. So how do we maximize the benefits and minimize the risks of personal monitoring data? I would suggest that this is by building relationships, building trust, building the infrastructure and building the evidence of societal benefit. I'm very uh, grateful to Jackie MacArthur, the project manager of the theme within the Data Science Centre, Aidan Doherty, the uh, public partners within the theme and all the BHF Data Science Centre and HDR UK theme. I look forward to your thoughts and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, fantastic. Um, and just encourage participants to keep us um, uploading their questions into the Q&A channel. Um, so um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Reach Sofat, who has recently taken up chair of pharm clinical pharmacology at the University of Liverpool. And she is the center's associate director for our enhancing cohorts theme. Uh, she's also been uh, busy performing a lot of the medicines related work, some of which you saw presented earlier on by Caroline Dale, who works closely with Reacher. Reach is going to talk to us now about embedding cardiovascular research into routine healthcare. Reacher. Great, thanks very much, Cathy. Um, and apologies, I'm, I'm in the office for once and some drilling has just started <laughs> above my head. So I hope it doesn't disturb um, the presentation too much. Um, so I think what we've heard um, over the course of today is the obvious reasons why we should embed research into routine clinical health care. And what I'd like to outline in um, this presentation is uh, just presenting kind of a framework of how we can begin to take this forward. So just to think about what um, our research design to date looks like. So here, what I've just represented is all the kind of research studies that we carry out. So existing um, analysis of primary healthcare records, population cohorts to detect incident disease, randomized control trials, case control studies, and prognostic cohorts. And if we look at the numbers of individuals involved in all of these, it's millions in um, uh, primary healthcare records, hundreds of thousands in population cohorts, although minimally incident disease, tens of thousands in randomized control trials and in cardiovascular disease this is really very true for us um, but not so many in other diseases and tens to maybe thousands in case control and prognostic trials but then if we think about the information that we want from all of these studies um, what can we actually glean from these studies um, in totality so from primary health care records we can certainly um, get phenotypes and as Spiros has highlighted and how we refine these phenotypes is absolutely critical but what we can't get from these studies is um, blood tests that are done uh, for research purposes, um, DNA um, and biomarkers. So we don't have that. From population cohorts, I think this is changing, but the reason that they are established are to um, actually enable us to get bespoke disease data, uh, biomarkers and DNA. Um, and whilst I put a cross on electronic health records, actually this is changing as we speak. And we've heard that today about how cohorts are beginning to link with electronic healthcare data. Randomized control trials are often carried out by industry. And sometimes this information isn't always accessible, but sometimes it is. And that is again, changing. And again, case control studies and prognostic cohorts are variable in terms of the information that we're available um, to use for research. So how can we take routine clinical care and how can we take the advantage of routine clinical care? So on this slide, what I've shown is a timeline that all of us are on. Uh, we're born and in the UK, we have a registration with an NHS number and we progress along this timeline. We may have an acute event and at that acute event, we may start to cycle through primary and secondary care. Um, we have complications, we have reviews, uh, we have readmissions to hospital and so forth. And we have hospital appointments and GP appointments, and then the inevitable is death. But however, as we progress along this timeline, there is 
uh, multiple in, uh, sets of information that are collected through electronic health records, uh, routine blood tests, medicines, um, patient reported symptoms through apps. Uh, so the NHS app, you can certainly put um, some information on there now. Imaging, which we've heard about, monitoring from ICUs and um, other critical care environments. Um, so actually the data is really, really rich. So if we can think about the data that we already collect as part of our routine clinical care and understand that we can link this with the very unique NHS number, we actually have the possibility of then aligning um, our routine clinical health care with bespoke data. Um, so that's blood tests for biomarkers, DNA, but as Tim's already alluded to, also wearables from our commonly held devices, be they watches, um, phones, computers, and so forth. And if we're enable, if we are able to uh, link all of this data, actually, this gives us um, an opportunity to link, at least across the UK, 65 million records, and we can then design all of these studies within our routine healthcare record. Um, and with the enhancement um, um, through additional data, um, so blood tests, um, taking advantage of the clinical contact to take research bloods, um, but also asking patients for consent to use their wearable data, um, these can, we can enhance our routine clinical healthcare data. So can this be done? So I think we've seen some really good examples um, today of how it actually can be done. And so we can begin to design um, case collections of common, rare and recallable individuals, um, draw controls from um, the healthy population, both from primary and secondary care, but then enhance these by record and registry linkage, which again, we've already heard about, creating omics repositories very much in the um, vein of, of UK Biobank and other cohort studies. And remembering that actually some of these repositories will become digital in time. So um, DNA can be um, extracted, sequenced, and then disposed of, so you don't actually have the headache of storing it over a long period of time. Imaging repositories so that we can link imaging, as we've very nicely heard, to um, genetic data to understand causes and consequences of disease, and uh, obviously a wearable repository with appropriate consents. So this is just one example that I've worked on in terms of disease collections, and this is stroke, where we have taken advantage of an acute stroke admission and taken consent at the front door to be able to link data using the NHS number with demographic, radiological, um, bloods, uh, routine bloods, as well as functional assessments, but taken the opportunity to take a blood test at the same time, and then think about linking it with using the NHS number to both re uh, registries, disease registries, to look at recurrent events, but also um, prospective and retrospective um, NHS number linkage to understand causes and consequences of disease, but also building in recall into um, the consent, so we can do experimental medicine studies, but also understand why individuals have recurrent events. Um, this was our stroke study that um, had um, a number of sites across the UK. We recruited eventually from 56 sites. We're not recruiting at the moment, but did have ethics um, across um, all nations in the UK, but didn't always didn't get around to collecting um, from all nations, but it is possible. Um, so in terms of um, the aims of in the enhancing cohorts theme, it's very much about building um, a platform capability for the cardiovascular community to combine both um, routinely collected data, linked he health records, data through a trusted research environment and also then begin to develop modules for imaging, wearables and omics data. And this is really to allow us to understand causes and consequences of disease better, run a number of uh, studies and study designs at scale and really create um, and establish a community of practice with appropriate governance. Thanks very much. Thank you. Fantastic team. You have finished with 30 seconds to spare, which I'm now going to donate uh, to myself to allow me to uh, introduce our final speaker of the day, um, uh, who's giving our, our final uh, keynote talk. Um, so it's a great delight to introduce Professor Nicholas Mills. Uh, Nick is BHF Professor of Cardiology at the University of Edinburgh. He's a consultant interventional cardiologist at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh.
and he leads the university's health and social care data-driven innovation team. Uh, and he has recently been extremely busy establishing um, and uh, being uh, helping to enable all sorts of research using NHS Lothian's health data safe haven, which is uh, lovingly entitled Data Loch. Um, so he has a multidisciplinary research group which uses linked regional and national healthcare data in Scotland to develop new approaches for diagnosis and risk stratification and prediction of individuals with heart disease and to evaluate uh, the impact of these on care and outcomes in practice. And Nick was, uh, and quite rightly so, elected last year as a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. So Nick, we're really looking forward to hearing you talk about implementation research in acute cardiac care, harnessing routine data. Nick. Thanks, Cathy. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. I have to say it's been an excellent day. Um, and I want to close the session by getting you all to think a little about how you can harness this phenomenal uh, data infrastructure uh, to conduct impactful research and illustrate perhaps uh, this with a few successes and failures uh, in the acute cardiac care setting. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so my research group um, is principally focused on trying to improve outcomes and care for people with myocardial infarction uh, and, and doing this by implementing new diagnostic tests uh, and care pathways. We um, have done a, a variety of different methodological approaches and I'm going to discuss a few of them. Implementation research is a kind of growing but not terribly well established field of health research. And it aims principally to evaluate the systematic uptake of treatments or tests that are already evidence-based, uh, but to understand how when we implement them into practice, uh, they affect patient care and whether they're safe or effective. Um, as I say, we've used various approaches, uh, but all of them have harnessed routine data. So I want to start with uh, a little historical example, if you don't mind, from my own hospital, which is the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. Um, and you don't need to Python or data linkage to interpret these data. Uh, so this uh, 60 years ago, medical registrar by the name of Desmond Julian reported a case series of five patients who all had myocardial infarction and he attempted to resuscitate them uh, across the wards of the Royal Infirmary. And at that time, defibrillation required open thoracotomy um, and not surprisingly, only one patient survived and they had significant uh, brain injury. Um, he, he reasoned that having patients within a single location in the hospital would enable rapid identification of major complications like cardiac arrest, cardiac rupture, tamponade. Um, fortunately, thoracotomy is no longer required for defibrillation, but it is for other uh, mechanical complications. Um, and he, he put forward, based on this data, the idea of a coronary care unit. Uh, to accelerate diagnosis and treatment of patients with a heart attack. He implemented his idea and six years later he reported his observations from the first 500 patients managed in what was the world's first coronary care unit. Uh, and he demonstrated a 20% reduction uh, in, in death following cardiac arrest. Uh, and I, I wish he'd published this photograph in his Lancet paper. It, it was published in the evening news. Uh, but he did have an illustration of the floor plan of our coronary care unit, which is where I did my first job as a house officer in cardiology. Um, of course, um, things have changed substantially since those time. Interesting video file there. That was an Apple Watch. I think you can just see it coming out of the background there. Um, with the introduction of more portable, more precise, uh, more detailed diagnostic tests, and this has really transformed the way that we identify and classify uh, heart attacks. But have these initiatives made any difference, a tangible difference from our patients? So I'm going to start with biomarkers. So developments in biomarkers and cardiac trombone in particular has really transformed what we consider a heart attack to be. And indeed, 
uh, in 2022, uh, the incidence of those major complications of a heart attack that I just showed you is vanishingly small, partly because of the way that we diagnose uh, the condition. So um, inevitably, uh, as we introduce more sensitive diagnostic tests into clinical practice, uh, we will have uh, a, a change in the phenotype uh, and, a, and a detrimental effect on specificity. And the question is whether these more sensitive tests, whether they're imaging tests or biomarkers, lead to better targeting of treatment, which then improves outcomes, or whether it's offset by reductions in specificity that lead to over-treatment and unnecessary burden for patients and harm. So um, the, the first question uh, that we wanted to address was whether the modern definition of a heart attack and implementing that into clinical practice was beneficial or, or harmful. Um, and we used a very simple quasi-experimental design, um, which many people wouldn't even consider to be research. But this is a controlled before and after study, single center. Uh, and we demonstrated that by measuring cardiac troponin in the background in all consecutive patients um, uh, using surplus material, that we identified a group of patients who with unreported increases in injury to the heart were at very high risk of recurrent myocardial infarction or death from cardiovascular disease in the future. And, and simply introducing this test into clinical practice uh, resulted in improved care and improved survival in this specific group of patients. Now, there are all sorts of limitations with this sort of study design, uh, but some strengths also. Uh, by enrolling absolutely consecutive patients, um, we avoid all selection bias, which is a major issue in most cardiovascular research. By suppressing the results uh, during the validation period, we're able to truly identify those that would benefit potentially uh, in both phases of the study. And by including control groups with low and high troponin concentrations where, change, where care was unchanged, uh, we're able to control for time-varying uh, effects. And we also use calendar matching. Uh, but, uh, of course, other changes in practice occurring during this time uh, could be responsible for better outcomes. And as a single centre study, uh, it limits the generalizability of what we can do. And back then, data linkage was not quite so easy. But um, in, enthused by the findings from this study, the, the field uh, worked hard to try and continue to iteratively improve and innovate uh, with the precision of these tests, such that uh, you fast forward to today and we could measure troponin in everyone, whether they're having a heart attack or not, and we're able to precisely define what the upper limit of normal should be, and then consider how we might use that to diagnose heart attacks. So when it comes to introducing the next generation of assays into practice, uh, we decided to be more ambitious and, and enroll, uh, adopt it across Scotland uh, and use a more sophisticated trial design uh, where we used a step wedge cluster design, randomizing 10 hospitals across Scotland to immediate or delayed implementation of this new test. And the hypothesis was that improving the sensitivity of the test in order to diagnose more heart attacks would uh, lead to better care and reduce future risk of myocardial infarction uh, or cardiac death. Um, so actually probably the most interesting finding from this trial occurred during a short pilot phase in one hospital where we enrolled 1,000 consecutive patients uh, from one centre and measured the test in the background. And now that we could quantify troponin in everyone, whether they a heart attack or not, we realised that troponin concentrations in men and women were completely different, and that only by using sex-specific upper left reference limits would we provide equality in terms of the number of proportion of patients coming to hospital with myocardial injury or infarction. And that changed our thinking quite early in the design of the trial. And so we adopted sex-specific uh, approaches. Um, in order to deliver the trial, we had to build a data infrastructure that mapped more than a dozen different routinely collected data sets from all 10 hospitals uh, that were participating. And we embedded our screening and enrollment tool into the order for the test in the electronic patient record. Uh, so that actually the usual care clinician ordering the test was doing the enrollment into the trial. Uh, we didn't seek individual consent because we were randomizing at the level of the hospital uh, and data was anonymized, linked and accessed through National Safe Haven in order to conduct the trial. 
Now, there are all sorts of challenges in doing a trial like this, but there are some strengths. Uh, it's pretty impractical uh, it, randomizing individual patients to one test or the other side by side in an emergency department. Um, again, you can include consecutive patients as identified by the usual care clinician, not the biased researcher trying to game the outcome of their trial. Um, and it allows you to include unwell patients, those who have complex multimorbidity or present out of hours to ensure the findings are generalizable to everyone. Uh, and theoretically, at least to the funder, it's less expensive and resource intensive. But as has been discussed in many of the presentations, data quality can be a challenge. Uh, and therefore, because it was a trial of a diagnostic test, we required adjudication and endpoint committee. Uh, and the regulations in this space are pretty complex. So we enrolled just under just over 48,000 patients. One in five had evidence of injury to the heart. And in that, uh, around one in six of those were only identified by the new test. Um, interestingly, half of all patients enrolled were women, which is unusual for a trial of acute coronary syndrome. Um, and disappointingly, despite increasing the number of patients identified with injury to the heart, we did not improve outcomes at one year. Um, however, because we have routine data, it's very cheap and cost effective to follow these patients up long term. And we are reporting at the ESC later this year uh, the, the long term outcomes of introducing this test into clinical care in Scotland. Um, so um, one of the things that um, what we, we learned from this trial is that um, sometimes you need to scratch beneath the surface of just reporting your primary outcome uh, and look at the rich data that we collected to understand why the trial did not successfully meet its goal. And in, in order to do that, we had to use um, access to individual patient level data, de-identified, to digitate the diagnosis. Um, and uh, myocardial infarction is kind of complicated. There's lots of patients who have injury to the heart, not due to plaque rupture. Uh, and in those patients, we have very little uh, evidence to guide our care. Uh, and if you look at the group that were reclassified, actually two thirds of them had injury to their heart due to non-ischemic mechanisms, uh, where we could not genuinely, I think, recommend treatments in order to improve outcomes. Furthermore, when we linked their outcomes to deaths at one year and looked at the causes of death, uh, those with non-ischemic myocardial injury died from a wide range of non-cardiovascular conditions in which we have very little evidence to change their outcome. So having done a lot of this work, we wanted to go back to the drawing board and look at whether we could do better. Um, this seemed to be a good test, but could we use it uh, in a different way? And the guideline recommendations at that point simply suggest using it as a binary yes-no test. Um, when it became obvious to us using the test in clinical practice that actually the, most of the information that we were gaining from this test was well below the upper reference limit in terms of helping us define risk. So what we did was we uh, used evidence from routine data to define uh, the optimal threshold in which to rule out a heart attack at presentation to hospital and we defined that as uh, the highest concentration that would identify the greatest number of patients as very low risk. Um, and then uh, demonstrated across 32,000 consecutive patients that the diagnostic performance of this threshold, unlike the upper reference limit, uh, was highly consistent across all age groups and all subpopulations. And then developed a simple pathway that allowed us to implement this into our clinical practice to identify low and high risk patients. But of course, uh, this is based on observation. We have no evidence that uh, guiding care by this would be safe or effective. And therefore, our next phase of our trial program was uh, to do a second step wedge cluster randomized trial, introducing this into clinical practice. And one of the challenges that I hope the Data Science Centre will resolve for us is that the number of sites available to do cluster randomized trials kept shrinking in Scotland as the hospitals merged. And we only had seven sites uh, to deliver. Uh, the next phase of the trial. So please, Cathy, uh, we need uh, more sites because uh, it's really difficult to do step wedge trials with small numbers. Um, but around half of the 32,000 patients were managed using the standard care thresholds and half the, uh, uh, the new pathway. And we demonstrated that introducing this into clinical practice reduced length of stay uh, by around three hours. Importantly, it increased the proportion of patients discharged directly from the emergency room by about half. And by following patients up for a year, we were able to demonstrate that there was no excess risk. Uh, 
actually we failed to meet our primary non-inferiority endpoint in this trial. Um, but at one year, outcomes clearly favoured the early light pathway. Uh, and I also learned that these trials are not without challenges because uh, step wedge cluster randomized trials with seven sites have all sorts of problems uh, when it comes to modeling them. And sometimes looking at the raw data it is more helpful than the, the modeling. But just before I finish, I just want to highlight the, some areas of ongoing uncertainty and research. Um, we're left with a, a, a wonderful learning healthcare system uh, with great data. Um, what are the next steps for the management of patients with acute coronary syndrome? Well, there is a group of patients in the middle uh, who are uh, currently neither low risk or high risk of intermediate risk. And routine data tells them they're 10 times more likely to have an event at one year than those that are low risk. Uh, and so our next phase is really uh, merging biomarkers and imaging uh, and using CT in this population. Uh, and we've demonstrated in our pilot study that our, you're three times more likely to have coronary disease if you're intermediate risk than you are if you're low risk. Uh, and we're conducting our next trial uh, as a, a CT trial. And you might say to me, Nick, we already know that CT works for coronary artery disease. Why do we need a trial? Well, we don't know how effective it is applying it in the emergency department and targeting patients using biomarkers for this test. And unfortunately, because CT involves radiation, you cannot do a step wedge randomized trial. Uh, and therefore we are uh, using individual patient randomization, but routine data in order to identify all consecutive patients, proportionate consent over the telephone once they've gone home to enroll them into the study has allowed us to keep going despite COVID. So just to finish a couple of uh, summary points, um, I think there are major opportunities with the BHF center um, to evaluate the impact of new tests, uh, established treatments, new care pathways uh, as they're applied in clinical practice. I do think there's a role for adjudication or validation of routine data. I think that's necessary sometimes to aid interpretation of the findings. Uh, and I think uh, once you've got your data infrastructure in place, the opportunity to extend your findings and, uh, in a learning healthcare system is, is fabulous. Um, but we do need UK-wide infrastructure in order to do these sorts of trials with robust power. Uh, so thank you very much, Cathy, and uh, thanks for uh, everyone involved in the research. Thanks, Nick. Uh, terrific talk. Um, and uh, perhaps I can pick up first on a, um, a plea that you lobbed uh, in my direction just towards the end of your talk um, on the need for more centres for cluster randomised trials. So, um, I mean, I guess the the obvious rather simplistic retort is to say increase your geographic area so i presume most of these yeah. studies have been conducted in scotland and have you thought about the possibilities of extending to other parts of the uk and if so are there some challenges there that we need to uh, that we need to crack to help with this endeavor i i it's a great question. I would love to do studies across the UK. Uh, I think we have great networks um, in the UK uh, and centres of expertise uh, and a brilliant opportunity. Um, I think it's difficult in Scotland knowing the regulatory environment really well and the data services really well to then uh, unpick how to do that in England uh, and vice versa. Uh, and I think the Data Science Centre gives us an opportunity to uh, enable access, I think, across uh, different regions in a way that we haven't been able to before um, because I, I, it's hard enough setting up a, a data-enabled trial in your own region let alone doing it across multiple regions within a country let alone doing it across different countries so there, there are uh, real challenges in doing this type of work um, uh, and, and it does need some oversight and, and i hope that the center will will provide that Thanks very much. So I hope Matt's still listening because a lot of this stuff is very relevant uh, for him in the clinical trials um, area. Um, so perhaps I've just mentioned Matt and I, I just wanted to pick up on um, uh, some of the different study designs that you were talking about. And you spoke about the use of step wedge randomized trials. Um, so you might, mm -hmm. for, for the non cognoscenti uh, in the audience, you might want to just briefly describe what those are before addressing my question, which which comes via Matt, who um, suggested to me that he'd never come across a step wedged randomized trial that was negative. Um, and I wondered if 
you had ever or whether there was some sort of inbuilt bias towards a positive result uh, inherent in the design there? Well, our first one was resoundingly negative and our second one failed to hit its non-inferiority uh, endpoints. So um, I don't think they are quite as easy as uh, that. I, I think that the stepwise trial, um, it, it's not necessarily the number of patients you have, it's the number of sites that give you power. And it's really difficult in the UK without having a UK wide infrastructure to have adequate power. Um, but, but the step wedge component uh, is that each site steps in at a different time period, and that allows you to adjust for time varying uh, aspects of care because care is always onwardly improving and evolving. And so to understand the impact of your intervention, you need to also compare outcomes during that parallel phase when you have sites that are allocated to the two different uh, uh, care, the intervention standard care, uh, as well as um, the before and after comparison that you get using a more conventional design. So that's why the step component is important. You've, of course, you can randomize sometimes on a GP practice level or even for some interventions on a ward level, or some studies have used uh, randomization by week. Uh, so one week they give one one they give saline, the next week they give um, bicarbonate. You know, there are other ways you can do these trials that don't necessarily require you to have multiple different regions to enable them. Um, but uh, lots of interesting trial designs out there. Um, individual patient randomization, if it was easy and cost effective to do, of course, is more powerful uh, and allows you to answer questions uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, but at the moment, it's pretty expensive and cumbersome to recruit in person. And I think some of the innovation required in the data uh, enabled trial section should be to make that easier and cheaper uh, to get patients to trials without actually physically having to go to them. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. So sort of democratizing the ability to take part in trials and perhaps to some extent taking the healthcare professional barrier uh out, out of the way and letting uh patients and and public decide for themselves um so just to pick up uh, a question from the ch from the q a section um could um could you comment on how you've managed to obtain patient buy-in and an ethics approval for running some of your studies without explicit individual consent and whether that was something that you uh had to work hard at or uh, you know, answer a lot of questions about or explain a lot? Yeah, really important. Um, so uh, all the tests that we're using are approved uh, and guideline recommended, um, and therefore we can use them um, and just introduce them into clinical practice. Um, I think if we were to be using a, a test that wasn't approved or hadn't been validated or hadn't been recommended by uh, guidelines, it'd be very difficult to do that in the context of a step wedge trial. You're randomizing at the hospital level and therefore the buy-in and consent comes from the, um, the uh, clinical director or medical director of those hospitals and boards. Um, so our patient representatives, uh, our researchers, uh, went to each of the hospitals and boards and made the case uh, and got their consent uh, as to whether it was appropriate to randomize their hospital uh, into the trial. But I agree, it's a, it's a very different um, type of design. Uh, the ethics committee, we had a fascinating discussion, um, but, it, but it is, I think, a very valid way of introducing a test that is already approved into practice if you want to determine whether there are benefits or not for the patients that are gonna be tested by it. But clearly patient public involvement in all of our research, given it involves routine data is vital, uh, whether it's in a randomized trial or the observational studies that we, we do in parallel. Um, um, was it helpful, Nick, um, that you could attend the Ethics Committee in person so that you could address these kind of questions directly and pick up on any misperceptions or misunderstandings and provide these types of explanations face-to-face? Uh, -face? Really important. I've never had to do an Ethics Committee that's not been in face-to-face. -face. Um, and what, what also we, we do is our, our patient representatives uh, come with us to the Ethics Committee. Um, because I find that most of the discussions at the Ethics Committee are not about the statistical methodology or the scientific rationale for doing the study. It's about the approach and how you approach patients, how you use data. And actually it's their view that's more important than my view in the Ethics Committee. Um, and so I found that really helpful and always do that. 
Um, so our patient representative comes with us to the ethics committee and answers all the questions that pertain to the use of patient data or the way that they're contacted and approached. Uh, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, so one other question that's come up in the chat um, or in the Q&A, uh, actually from earlier on, but I think you'd be a great person to address it and then maybe we can pull in anyone else from amongst the associate directors who wants to um, uh, think about this one. So for, for many cardiovascular outcomes, they have been well validated against a sort of expert diagnosis gold standard in electronic health records, but for others, that's not the case. Um, and the question is, would it be helpful to get individual broad consent from a large number of patients for validating new electronic health record code sets directly against their medical directly against their medical records? This is a question very close to my heart because it's what I was trying to do for many years uh, in UK yeah. Biobank, but again, difficult to scale. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really interesting proposal um, and gaining consent to access every aspect of their records would be fabulous. Um, the way that we've done adjudication in all of our trials does involve access to the patient record, but we get um, a slightly sanitized, pulled out view uh, with no patient identifiers on it. But we, we are able to get letters, for example, and, and um, reports from uh, cardiac testing uh, and quite a lot of the, the kind of rich information that you need in order to validate what an outcome is. But it's a lot of work for the data processors to uh, present that uh, de-identified version of the data uh, for you. And of course, they only do it for one condition. And I guess what you want to do in UK Biobank and more broadly for trials is to validate a wide range of outcomes. So I think that would be a great initiative, getting people to agree to provide consent to access all aspects of their uh, data in order to validate uh, diagnostic coding. I think it's a great suggestion. Yeah, and just thinking about what you've just described there, um, think about ways in which we might be able to use some of the regional or hospital-based um, data safe haven resources like Dataloc and many others around the country to support this sort of work um, with appropriate public and, and patient buy-in. It might even be possible to do it without explicit one-by-one uh, -one individual consent, um, but th that would be something that would be really interesting to discuss. I complete, completely agree. Um, and, and I think um, that the pa patient public would be very likely to be supportive because if we are going to increasingly rely on routine data to inform clinical practice and uh, our strategy, we need to be absolutely confident that we understand that data and that, that it's very easy for linked data to go wrong. Um, and so it does need to be very carefully sense checked uh, and validated. So I'm sure we get very good support for that. Excellent. I hope Matt's listening and I know Spiros is because I think this is a, a great uh, area for us to potentially think about taking forward along with all the others. So Nick, thank you very much for your fantastic talk and for dealing with uh, quite a number of wide ranging questions. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for giving the last talk of our day. So we're coming to the end of the meeting, um, everybody, and I think um, you'd agree that we've uh, had a wealth of really high quality content. Um, so we, we had a really interesting, sometimes quite scary uh, patient perspective early on from Calvin Pittman, our, the lay representative on our oversight committee. We've had three fantastic keynote talks from really extraordinarily accomplished guest speakers, hearing about the future vision for healthcare from Doug Gurr. Um, hearing about science based on ethnically diverse cohorts from Deborah Lawler, hearing about the way in which acute cardiac care research can be conducted at scale using routine data uh, from Nick Mills just now. We had a great overview of the centre at the beginning of the day from Lynn Morris, and then throughout the course of the day, we've had I think enticing, and I hope enticing introductions to and deep dives into our six thematic areas of activity. So insights from national linked structured health data, the really exciting possibilities of research using unstructured imaging data at scale, how to conduct clinical trials that take advantage of linked health data and all the things that we need to achieve to make that world even more possible than it currently is.
uh, we've heard about the whys, wherefores, and potential massive benefits of integrating personal monitoring data into research studies and clinical care. We've heard about the creation of computable phenotypes at massive whole system level from uh, uh, from Spiriston Access. And from Reacher, we heard about uh, a vision for embedding research cohorts within the NHS. So I think uh, uh, hopefully you agree that we've had a fantastic and very broad ranging day. So it just remains for me to uh, thank people for everything uh, that they've done to make this day possible. So uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all of you for attending the day. Um, I hope you found it enjoyable. And I'd like to remind you uh, to complete the feedback survey that we'll share with you just towards the end of the webinar, hopefully in the meeting chat or Q&A function or something that you can see in front of you. Um, and uh, in, in that case, please do complete it straight away. It's extremely short, um, but we just want to hear a little bit back from you. Um, and if not, we'll send it to you uh, using the email that you provided us with uh, when you registered. Um, and uh, I'd also like to thank all of the speakers who have uh, entertained, uh, informed and excited us uh, throughout the course of the day um, and have participated in some really rich discussions. I'd like to thank uh, the organisers of the meeting, so our colleagues at MPG, um, Andrew and others, um, and the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre and uh, Health Data Research UK team who have been squirrelling away behind the scenes to make sure everything was fitting fitting together properly. So Sam, uh, Lynn, Jackie, Lydia, Reuven, Amanda, and no doubt others, thank you all very much for everything that you've been doing today. Um, if you, any of you would like to hear more about the BHF Data Science Centre, then do please uh, look at our web pages follow us on, on Twitter, come to our seminars, uh, ask us questions, uh, join our collaborations, uh, get involved in any way that you think you would like to and possibly can. And finally, thank you very much to all of those who are collaborating with us um, in terms of making data uh, more accessible um, and uh, easier to use for patient and public benefit. Thank you all very much. Um, I'd like to finish the meeting now and uh, invite you to enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening and thanks for coming.